should start. So it's it's my great um, pleasure to. Um, so first of all, sorry, I'm I'm Sandrine Heitz. I'm a, the um, Imperial um, co-director of the of the ICN. So it is my great pleasure to to welcome um, Jess Wade to give today's um, LCN lunchtime seminar. Uh, so Jess received uh, her PhD and uh, did her um, uh, undergrad in, in physics at, at Imperial College. Um, she she then uh, left to King's College to uh, to have, take on a position as an outreach officer. So it's interesting because King's is part of the LCN now as well. So so that's all uh, you know very uh, very interesting in terms of links. Um, she came back to do a, a, a postdoc um, at Imperial and now is uh, um, is leading her own research group as uh, an Imperial College Research Fellow um, hosted by Material. So, uh, so we're very um, pleased to have her um, in the department um, and she now focuses on spin selectivity and, and, and chiral materials mostly. Um, so it, it's particularly uh, fitting and, and a great honour to have Jess talk on today of all days. Uh, of, in, on International Women's Day, uh, because uh, Jess has 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 made has had enormous contributions um, in the area, and uh, you know just just done done, done a lot of things to uh, increase diversity in in in, the, in STEM fields uh, through her entries in in Wikipedia and um, and other efforts as well that have been recognised with a whole lot of prizes, um, including the Julia Higgins uh, Medal at Imperial and, and an MBE as well. Um, other uh, great uh, news as well uh, for um, the LCN is, is this, uh, you know, is this dress clearly committed to, to the field of nano. Uh, she has uh, combined her love of nano and of diversity in um, in, in, in writing a book um, geared um, towards, I think, children, uh, beautifully illustrated, um, and that is called Nano, um, the spectacular science of the very, very small. Um, so uh, so uh, thank you very much, Jess. I, I, I'm sure you'll inspire uh, generations of, um, of scientists coming into Nano, so we, we thank you for that. Um, but let's move on to uh, her beautiful science um, and hear about her talk on chiral materials and application in next generation devices with some just moving images. I'm, I'm mesmerized already. So thank you very much, Jess. Thank you so much, Sandrine. That was a very overwhelming and embarrassing introduction, but but I'm gonna um, get started because I don't have much time with you today. So my name is Jess. I am a research fellow now working in, well, in the lab of Sandrine in the Department of Materials at Imperial College London. And today I'm going to talk to you about the work that I've been doing for the past few years, looking at chiral materials and how we can make use of them in next generation electronic devices. I wanted to start off by saying we've had some really horrible news in the physics department in the last week, a kind of titan of device physics. Professor Alistair Campbell unfortunately passed away last weekend. And Al was really my introduction to solid state physics when I joined Imperial in 2008. He was my postdoc advisor throughout my kind of introduction to chiral materials. And he's really led the applications of these beautiful molecules and polymers into a whole bunch of different devices. He's a phenomenally important member of the Center for Processable Electronics. And, and he will be incredibly missed. And, and, and I just wanted to recognize the fact, well, the influence that he's had on my career as a scientist. And I guess everything in this is, is, is dedicated in honor of him. So I don't have much time today, but I'm not going to waste it by talking to you about what printed electronic materials are, because I think probably everyone in the LCN already knows. I thought I'd give you a kind of whistle stop, whistle stop two slide introduction to chirality and then talk about how we can make use of these beautiful materials into new technological applications. Chiral objects are incredibly fascinating. They exist as a pair of non-superimposable mirror image pairs. Chirality can exist across a bunch of different length scales. So from the subatomic to the molecular to macroscopic objects. And you can see it really clearly in your hand. Your left and your right hand are non-superimposable mirror images of one another. If you put them palm to palm, they're mirror images. But if you lay them face up, then they're not mirror images at all. I guess the fascinating thing about chirality and the reason that it's been looked at and studied for application in electronic and photonic devices 
is that it's not only electrons and molecules and macroscopic objects that can be chiral, but also light can be chiral. Circularly polarized light, left and right handed versions can be thought of as chiral as well. Something I find really interesting about the field of chirality is that it's a relatively new one. We've only known about chiral objects or that objects could be chiral in the last 150, 160 years. And it was actually Louis Pasteur who gave us wine and pasteurization and vaccines, all of these great things that Louis Pasteur did. It was, it was long before he got into that kind of biochemistry world that he was actually looking at chirality. It was very shortly after he finished his PhD, a few years after he got his PhD. And what Pasteur was looking at on the vineyard that he grew up in was the crystals that formed in, in wine barrels. And in these wine barrels, you had these beautiful crystals of something called tartaric acid. And tartaric acid does something very interesting to plain polarized light. So if you have a plain polarized light wave going into tartaric acid, which I'll, I'll try and use my laser pointer to show you, then this optical rotation, it undergoes optical rotation, the plane of polarization rotates. And this was fascinating and it had fascinated a bunch of scientists, but it wasn't until Louis Pasteur came on and made this great scientific leap to say, actually, the molecules, the crystals in these structure exist as left and right handed non superimposable mirror image pairs. And that's what's causing this optical rotation that we managed to understand chirality at all and then translate this into a whole bunch of different technologies and industries. There's really beautiful writing about how Louis Pasteur managed to make this jump in the first place. And I'd encourage you all to read it and I'm happy to share any. But one of the proposals, the hypotheses, is that before Louis Pasteur studied science at all, he actually went to art school. And what he did was this process in art called lithography, which lots of you might use for technology, where he etched away an image onto a surface and then pressed it onto a different surface to create the non-superimposable mirror image form. And I think this is really quite remarkable. You know, we talk about the impact of art and science, and this is a fantastic demonstration of it. But now we think about and use chirality in the fragrance industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, because left and right handed molecules or pharmaceutical drugs or, or fragrances have very different interactions with our bodies. So we're very well aware of this now and we manipulate it a lot, but it's really only in the last 150 years that we've known about it at all. So now how can these wonderful materials be made use of in, in new technologies? And I think this is the really exciting part. I was led and guided by fantastic chemists and actually there are lots of them at Imperial, now led by, by Matt Fuchter, a professor in chemistry and also Jochen Brandt, a, a new university research fellow from the Royal Society in Chemistry as well, where we're designing and looking at technologically relevant chiral small molecules and polymers. So here we've taken that beautiful chirality that Pasteur introduced us to that manifests across all these different length scales and we've put it into small molecules into polymer structures. And what we're finding, and, and hopefully I'll convince you of this during this talk, is that there are a whole bunch of different applications where chiral materials really transform what we could do otherwise with printed electronic systems. From spintronics to high performance displays to medical imaging to encrypted communications because our eyes can't differentiate left and right handed light. So sending signals in left and right handed light means you can encrypt the information that you're sending to quantum optics. And, and recently, my, my fascination has been the application of chiral materials in magnetic field sensing. But really how I got into all of this through the guidance of Matt and also Al, who I mentioned at the introduction, was in display technologies. And, and in displays, it's really interesting. So lots of you will have heard of, of organic light emitting diodes, OLEDs. Lots of you will have worked on OLEDs probably, and also thought about the, the influence that research from the LCN has had on L OLED technologies. OLEDs are built from this kind of interesting sandwich-like structure that some of you may even make. You have a bunch of different layers that serve different purposes, and often you put in different layers to improve charge transport and injection. But at the most basic level, we have our kind of ITO substrate, which is transparent. That's an electrode. That's where we can inject some charges from. We have our active layer that will emit the light. So this is really crucial. <laughs> we need that layer. This is made from our beautiful polymers and molecules that our chemistry friends make. We have an electrode at the back, and that's obviously where we inject charges as well. 
and then we have this back cover. And the kind of process in its most simple form is that we inject charges from the ITO in this back electrode. They travel through the OLED material and they emit light. Now, without having something called an anti-glare filter there, what would happen is if you were outside looking at your mobile phone or if you were watching television with a light on behind you, light would transport through this structure. It would move through this complicated sandwich of st light structure, hit off this back electrode, which is reflective. It's a shiny electrode and come back. And, and that process of light moving through the pixels in your display and coming back would distort the image that you'd get. So you wouldn't be able to send a text message in bright sunlight. So what display manufacturers do is they include this anti-glare filter. And that's basically a combination of optical components that takes this unpolarized light. It turns it into circularly polarized light. So it makes it circularly polarized. Say it makes it into left-handed light. That left-handed light hits off that mirror at the back and turns into a right-handed light because that's what happens when circularly polarized light hits off something shiny. And that right-handed light can't get out of this anti-glare filter anymore. So these are really, really good at improving contrast and, and, and improving your ability to send texts outside. Very focused on sending texts outside. You can tell I want to get outside again. <laughs> Now, what would happen and what does happen is if we don't manipulate the light coming out of the pixels of our OLED, we're losing a lot of their brightness and intensity. And that's because a non circularly polarized OLED, pixels from a conventional organic light emitting material would emit unpolarized light. And unpolarized light is 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed. And that would mean when it gets to this anti-glare filter, it gets stuck in that display and lost. And this is what's happening at the moment. So you think your, your battery life of your phone or tablet is pretty bad. And that's because a huge amount of it is going to powering this display. And actually, we're only getting half of the light out of it. So, so what Matt and Jochen and a bunch of other scientists across Imperial have been working on is generating circularly polarized luminescence from these beautiful polymers and small molecules so that we massively, massively improve the efficiency of our devices. There's a few different ways to do this, and I'm going to try and introduce a few of them over the next couple of slides. A figure of merit for circularly polarized light, how we want to define how circularly polarized it is, how much we can use this in our display technologies, is something called the disymmetry, a word that I rarely spell correctly the first time I try and write it out. And disymmetry is an interesting thing. It can manifest across different length scales. We can think about disymmetry at the molecular length scale, so the kind of small molecule, individual atoms clustering together length scale, or we can think of it at the macroscopic scale, so building supramolecular assemblies of, of, of polymer and molecule systems. At the molecular length scale, we have to define it by a few different expressions. We have the rotational strength, which is related to the electronic transition dipole moment of a particular transition and the magnetic transition dipole moment. The rotational strength is basically the dot product of the electronic and magnetic transition dipole moments. In general, for a particular emission, for a particular um, color of light that we want to get out or a particular color of light that we want to absorb, we define something called the dipole strength. And this is related to transitions between the emissive state and the ground state. So we have our emissive state J and the ground state I, and we have a dipole strength that relates the two of them. Now, when we want to calculate the disymmetry of a molecular system, we have to do a little bit more of a complicated expression that combines this dipole strength and this rotational strength. And there's a little bit of maths, but the important thing that comes out is we end up with an expression where we have the magnetic transition dipole moment over the electric transition dipole moment. And it's intimately related to the angle between those two transition dipole moments. And this is fantastic. Knowing this lets our fantastic and clever chem friends in chemistry design really beautiful molecules that should be able to maximize our disymmetry. But we've got a really fundamental limitation when we're thinking about isolated small molecules. And that is that they're generally designed to, oh, I should say the disymmetry can vary between minus two and plus two for fully left-handed or fully right-handed systems. Now, coming back to this issue with small molecules, they're generally designed such that their mu is maximized, right? You want your electronic transitions to be as strong as possible so that the light coming out will be as strong as possible. 
And what that means is that for the majority of them, you have electronic transition dipole moments that are three, 300, 3000 times bigger than our magnetic transition dipole moments. And this is really a limiting step on how strong our disymmetry we can be. For isolated small molecules, you typically get disymmetry of about 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus three, no matter how clever the chemi chemical design is. And what's proved difficult so far is how we can manipulate and maximize this molecular level disymmetry in the solid states. Now, at the macroscopic scale, we can think much more about our material science education, particularly the morphology and structure of liquid crystals. If you've ever looked at the shells of these beautiful beetles, maybe you've been watching, I think David Attenborough has a new series on, on structural colour in nature. But these are, are beautiful beetles called jewel beetles. And in the shells of these beetles, their colour comes from their nanostructure, which we love at the LCN. But in the shells of these beetles, they've got a polymer called chitin, a naturally occurring polymer. And what chitin does in these beetle shells is it stacks in a cholesteric, a chiral pneumatic like liquid crystalline assembly where you have your rigid backbones of, of, of polymer. So you have your rigid backbones of this chitin and every layer on top is twisted a little bit with respect to the layer below. And when you go through a full revolution of these rotating polymer backbones, it's something called the pitch. And that will give you these really interesting properties when you shine light on it, such that if you shine light of an appropriate wavelength that corresponds with this pitch of, of the, the backbones of this polymer lining up in the beetle shell, it will come back to you circularly polarized. You can, you can see this when you look through 3D cinema glasses, which have a left-handed and a right-handed lens. You can see it really clearly. So the light reflected from these beetles at an appropriate wavelength that corresponds to this pitch comes back to us circularly polarized. So not only is the nanostructure giving it color at all, but it's also reflecting circularly polarized light back. And this is really extraordinary. We can try and do this in molecular systems and kind of functional electronic systems as well. We can do that by building a supramolecular assembly of small molecules, or we can take it to bigger conjugated systems like polymers. Now, as you all know, or I hope you all know, or you've thought about, Polymers uh, typically emit, it's so distracting when people join the lobby. I'm so glad everyone's here though. Polymers typically emit unpolarized light. So if you've gone through any material science education, you've thought of polymers in this form of kind of disordered spaghettis that like to assemble in a kind of disordered matrix on, onto a substrate. And the light coming out of these materials would be unpolarized. Now we know for certain polymers, we can get that light to be linearly polarized by processing them in the correct way. So we can make these beautiful polymer backbones unfurl and straighten out such that the light that comes out of these extended chromophores is linearly polarized. What's been less clear but is emerging now is how we can get these structures to emit circularly polarized light. And kind of the conventional thinking, I think until our group came along a few years ago, was that in polymer systems, when you've built some kind of structure like this, your light becomes circularly polarized. It starts off linearly polarized coming out of these rigid polymer backbones. But as it propagates through this chiral structure, it becomes circularly polarized. And this was really the working theory for all polymer based organic electronic CP light emitters for a really long time. Now, what this does is it means you'd have a really, really inefficient device. And that's because we'd have to have the active layer. So the part of our OLED that's emitting light, if it was built on this kind of cholesteric chiral pneumatic like structure, our active layer would have to be of thicknesses comparable to the wavelengths of light that we want to emit. Remember from the beetle example, we see that CP reflection at the wavelengths of light corresponding to that pitch in the beetle shell. And this would be really, really bad for device performance. So anyone who's made an OLED or an OPV or an OPD will have thought about the fact that efficiency is intimately related to the thickness of our active layer and actually thinner layers are better. So now I've given you this whole long introduction. I only have five minutes to tell you about the great science that we've done. We have taken a bunch of optimized organic light emitting polymers, things like F8, but F8BT, but other polyfluorine derivatives as well. And we measure something called the circular dichroism first. And the circular dichroism is the differential absorption of left and right handed light. So a circular dichroism of zero is A-OK -okay for an achiral polymer. This isn't chiral, remember. 
this is what we expect. This is in a thin film. We have wavelengths on the x-axis and here we have the intensity of the circular dichroism. Now, if we add a small amount of these beautiful chiral small molecules, which, which we get from Matt and Jochen's group, we form, we, we induce some kind of small circular dichroism in that blend system. So we can see this small circular dichroism, particularly in the kind of blue, the higher energy part of the spectrum. Now, what we found is when we anneal this blend system, we can massively amplify that circular dichroism. But now we're seeing it in the polymers absorption band. So we're seeing incredibly strong, intense circularly polarized absorption at transitions that correspond to the polymer. And this is really, really cool. We've spent a few years now optimizing this processing and also exploring that family of different polyfluorine derivatives from PFO to F8BT to F8T2, and really looking at how that chemical structure influences the circular dichroism that we can get. Now, I don't have enough time to go through the full optimization process with you, but we did a bunch of really, really beautiful optimization at Diamond, to the, the synchrotron, to look at the exact temperatures and times we need to anneal these structures for to maximize this chiroptical response, which has been really, really brilliant. We've then taken those perfect active layers and put them into the layers of an OLED. So put them into an OLED structure. This has been led by a researcher called Lee, who was a PhD student in the Center for Plastic Electronics and has just got a position in Sweden. We started off with conventional OLEDs. And, and in these, we really manipulated the interlayers to improve charge injection. And we managed to get some really, really efficient devices. So we took our beautiful cyclically polarizing layers, we put them into this OLED structure, we put in a few different interlayers, and then we massively amplified the, the luminance and the current efficiency. So these were pretty high performance. We then inverted the device geometry. So we put in different interlayers such that electrons and holes are injected from opposite sides. And we ma managed to actually improve that device efficiency even more. So these are kind of state of the art. You could use these in real world applications. We've also since been investigating stable and high efficiency blue CPO LEDs. Something we noticed along this journey though, was that we were seeing very interesting chiroptical phenomena emerging. And that was saying to us that actually we can manipulate by, by changing the handedness of the active layer, we can use the active layer thickness or the device geometry to manipulate the handedness of light coming out. So if we fix the handedness of the active layer, if we fix the composition of that using our lovely a chiral polymer chiral additive blend, we can change the handedness of light being emitted. And this is really extraordinary. What it really tells us is that actually we don't have this cholesteric structure at all. We don't have this chiral pneumatic structure. Something much more interesting is going on. Because if we had this structure, we wouldn't see that dependence on active layer thickness, and we wouldn't see that dependence on device geometry. So this is where we turn to some really, really beautiful characterization techniques. And, and I can't go into them all today because we really, really don't have enough time, but I'm happy to talk at length with anyone who's interested later on. One was, was this beautiful technique called Muller matrix spectroscopic ellipsometry, which lets us untangle the linear and circular contributions to the chiroptical response. So by doing measurements like this, we can really separate what's coming from a truly chiral emission or absorption from any linear artifacts which creep into other measurements. We did some beautiful resonance soft X-ray scattering where you use a linearly polarized X-ray coming in from, from a synchrotron like the advanced light source. And you can study using this linearly polarized X-ray, you get extraordinary insight into the assembly of helical arrays. So typically when you, get X when you do X-ray measurements, you get really, really nice distance and structure relationships and information about crystalline systems. We know that our systems aren't particularly crystalline, but this technique, this resonance with carbon and using this beautiful linearly polarized X-ray on the excitation lets us look at the assembly and the structure of helical arrays, helical distributions of electrons, which we really hadn't been able to do before. And then we did some really, really great um, high resolution AFM with the University of Nottingham that really let us put together all of these different things and build a much more comprehensive picture about what's going on. Now, without going too much into the detail, because I think I have about three minutes before we go to, to questions, 
what we had to do to to realize and combine all of the results of these different techniques was to build a much more complicated optical model than had previously been considered. When you try and understand and simulate the properties of these different materials, you turn to, to this kind of optical modeling. And for general conventional materials, you build an optical model that has a dielectric permittivity tensor in. This is certainly something I was interested in, introduced to during my physics undergrad, so probably by Al as well. For a conventional material, for a conventional set of polymers, for a cholesteric liquid crystal, for any of these things, we've only really considered this dielectric permittivity tensor. So we can introduce that to our optical model and we can, we can be happy with that. But what we found was this really doesn't fit the data we collect. It really doesn't fit the data that we collect from Muller matrix spectroscopic ellipsometry or the other measurements if we just rely on this dielectric permittivity tensor. So what we had to introduce was this magnetoelectric coupling in the form of these optical activity tensors on these diagonals. And by doing that, we could fully fit the data that we recorded in reflection and in transmission, making us quite convinced that we've worked out what the system is. Combining that with our other techniques, our resonance soft X-ray scattering and also our high resolution AFM, we managed to build this really, really beautiful crystal, well, not crystal, but molecular structure that we believe is giving rise to these intense chiroptical phenomena. It's called a, a weakly ordered double twist cylinder blue phase. And it kind of combines all of the properties that I mentioned before. It combines this magnetoelectric coupling, thinking about chirality at a molecular level. We've got an enhanced chiral phase. We've got this kind of supramolecular assembly of, of twisted polymer backbones. And we can actually see this structure emerging in AFM. So, so before I, I, I go to close and to say thank you, something that we thought was, was could we take this molecular structure, now we've optimized it and we've worked out the optical and the molecular model, can we take this molecular structure and use it to boost the efficiency of small molecule emitters? And what we found really recently, and I think this is really, really exciting, is that we 100% can. We can make use of these beautiful properties of small molecules, like their high photoluminescence quantum yields and their tunable electronic properties. We can take away from the fact that they have intrinsically low CP activity. We can amplify that. And we used our polymer matrices to amplify that in exactly this molecule. So we took this, this small molecule emitter, we embedded it into one of these beautiful double twist cylinder blue phases. We had this really, really interesting process of, of circularly polarized force to resonance energy transfer such that, and, and you'll have to read the paper because it's such a nice study, such that we could take something with a disymmetry of 10 to the minus 4, we could put it into our polymer matrix and we could amplify that disymmetry to something that you could really, really put into a working device. And this, I think, is really, really cool. So we've shown that you can optimize the processing for strong chiral light emission. It has super interesting molecular packing, and we can put these into really high performance, high efficiency OLEDs and OPDs. And actually, we're still doing a bunch of really, really interesting experiments and measurements with, with collaborators all over the world to understand it. I don't think I'm going to have time to tell you at all about, about the work on spindronics, but I'm but if anyone has any questions, I can certainly jump to that in, in, in the answers that I hope to give. But really, we focused on high performance displays. What my work is now focusing on in, in Sandrine's fantastic spin lab in the Department of Materials is understanding spin related phenomena in chiral materials. So how does the handedness of the chiral molecule or polymer influence how electrons of particular spins propagate through that device? And, and this is super exciting and really making use of all the extraordinary fabrication facilities within the LCN, I should say. So I want to have time to say thank you to everyone, obviously to Matt and Al, without which I would never have been introduced to chiral materials, to the fantastic team across materials, physics and chemistry at Imperial, to all of our external collaborators who've made this really, really exciting to work on. You know, every day I think I open my inbox to a new discovery we're making about these systems obviously to Sandrine and also to her fantastic team, mainly to De Don Cook at the moment, who's been introducing me to how to use everything in the spin lab and also to other members of the Center for Plastic and Processable Electronics who've made all this research possible. So I think that's probably too much from me. Um, so if you have any questions, you can, you can send me an email or you can find me on Twitter and I'll talk at length about Muller matrix spectroscopic ellipsometry. But thanks for now.
muted, Sundry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jess. Uh, that was amazing. Thanks for um, for 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 taking us through all of this research. It's uh, um, yeah, so lots of amazing um, discoveries there, and lots to discuss. And with with our record audience, um, who will hopefully have some questions, please feel free to um, write questions in the chat, raise your hand, unmute yourself. Um, I will do my best to keep my eyes open um and okay i'm seeing something oh please go ahead i i think i've got i think it's michelle uh yes hello thank you uh, so i have a, a quick question so when you were talking about the anti-glare layer that we yeah. can add and the problem is that um, if we have like polar, we lose basically 50% of the light that's not polarized because it's not polarized in the right uh, with the light handed. Uh, it's either left handed or right handed. So my question was if like, why do we lose that light? Because shouldn't it like uh, be reflected back, then be reflected again to the uh, metal uh, electrode and then it should change handiness and then it should pass and I'm thinking is it because it gets absorbed because like a really good display would have a refresh rate of 120 hertz so the travel time between the layers shouldn't be that much of a problem I think that's a really really good question and actually yes these materials also strongly absorb circularly polarized light as I showed you not only are they emitting circularly polarized light but their circularly polarized absorption is quite strong as well so if you have light that bounces around within this cavity of the OLED you no longer have a handle on the handedness that's coming out but also the intensity you lose a lot every time it propagates through that system so yes your point that it would then reflect back of this anti-glare filter, come back to the electrode, invert the handedness and go out again. That's completely true, but would have lost some of the, the light in the process of that. So would it be good to try and find a way to have a layer that doesn't absorb much in the wavelength that we are interested in? It would be really great. I mean, tuning from a kind of device manufacturing perspective, I think identifying materials that absorb and emit strongly, you know, separated strongly from one another might be quite complicated. It might be quite challenging synthetically to do, but certainly it's something that's that's worth a try. Also, these chiral materials are just fascinating for a bunch of different applications. So, so yeah, the, the displays is the starting point. You could probably manipulate the active layers more, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think it's a really good comment and suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anatoly, you had a question? Hi, thank you very much. Very interesting talk, very inspiring talk as well. Um, so you showed this results on the polymer, chiral polymer, which emits at 500 nanometers, essentially blue region. So is it possible to get chiral polymers in red or infrared? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. I mean, the interesting thing when you start digging into the literature of these CP light emitting polymers is that the majority of them are polyfluorine derivatives. Most of them emit kind of blue green colors. When you start extending to, to redder and infrared systems, I've yet to find one that will emit strongly circularly polarized light. So I can play around with the recipe and really spend a lot of time in the clean room trying to increase as much as we can get out of that polymer. But I've really struggled for any of the red emitting systems, I think because it's more challenging to form this chiral phase. You know, you know, I showed some of those chemical structures before of the polymer where you had this polyfluorine unit and then you have these different units between the polyfluorines. And that changes, essentially that changes the ease of the polymer backbone to twist and form this chiral phase, but also the color of light that will come out. And as you introduce bulkier and bulkier components of that or longer, longer sections between the polyfluorines, i.e. to make it redder light, it's much harder to induce this chiral phase. 
so from a kind of chemical synthesis and design perspective, it's actually quite challenging. But certainly it's something that we're exploring for, for, for detection and also for, you know, trying to create systems that are more efficient. If we could get a red, a really high efficiency red emitter as well, that would be really fantastic. So it's something we're looking at, but have yet to answer. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Any any further questions? On on the topic of, of the different um, emission wavelengths and so on, the, your um, the 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 architecture that you showed with the two hundred and eighty nanometers, with the, how how critical is it to to manage those distances and uh, in in terms of the wavelengths that you you will be emitting and and how how much control do you have over that? For for which one? For the, the final, like the, the diagram of, of your, um, uh, of the phase that you're forming. Um, so, with so that's, that I think, I think probably that phase, that separation does have served some role in amplifying the chiroptical response, but it's probably impacted by the components that you put into the blend. So if you use these CP light emitting, poly if you use these light emitting polymers and the chiral small molecule additives, those different those distances between the kind of cylinders in your double twist cylinder blue phase might change and they're not you know perfectly 280 nanometers apart i think probably having something that corresponds you know when you take into account the refractive index of the material corresponds a little bit to the wavelengths that you want to get out is really really important and it's why part of the reason why it's difficult to amplify the chiroptical response of small molecules because the length scales are just so different to anything you'd want to think about for for visible light emission. I think that um, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but certainly it's something to think about in the design of these materials is the phase they form in the solid state. You know, it's 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 like a fascinating area because chemists have this incredible way to design new molecules and new materials. But you don't only have to think about what their light emission or absorption would be like in, you know, in solution. So how their disymmetry might act in solution, what we can measure. But also when we put that into the solid state and form this phase, how easy is it to manipulate that? How do they pack together? And then from that, what are their electronic and optical properties like? You know, it's a really interesting discussion to, to have. How can we amplify the disymmetry, but also the device performance? And luckily, there are really great people working on it. So you kind of learn incrementally how you can do that all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. The, the sort of hierarchical, um, um, also the length scales that are involved um, is from the molecular to the, the, the few tens and few hundreds of nanometers. So, it, so it's yeah, really lots going on um, and, and, and lots that you've tackled and, and, and still, still to discover. So that's very exciting. Um, and I don't see any further questions in the chat, but um, uh, yeah, you, I think Jess has indicated that you'd be happy to have questions um, on Twitter, on um, <laughs> email. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has any questions that they want to ask, particularly about this, you know, what we're now studying, me and Jochen and Sandrine and others across college are looking at spin-related transport through chiral materials. And I think this is really fascinating and it's really new. And and it's something that we have a whole bunch of ways to investigate in the LCN. So if anyone's interested in using chiral materials for those applications, I'm really happy to talk about that whenever you send an email. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, uh, maybe a, a, a final question. Uh, the one that I, 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 you know, I would have loved to ask, which which came up in the chat. Um, can, just can you spend the last minute, maybe? Uh, so this is a question from Erin. Can you elaborate on the Spintronics applications? Oh, great question. So, so, <laughs> so um, this is this is recently emerging research that's kind of in the past couple of years that has looked at charge transport through chiral layers and chiral systems from kind of assembled proteins to DNA to, to chiral functional materials and shown that the spin filtering occurs. So electrons with spins of one handedness are preferentially transported through a chiral system compared to electrons of the opposite handedness. And this is really interesting. It makes us look at the whole process of electron transport anyway, because obviously, you know, electrons don't only carry charge, but they also carry spin. And that spin gives them a magnetic dipole moment. Those electrons that have this 
this angular momentum and also this charge have a magnetic dipole moment. As they move through a helical arrangement of electrons, so as they move through a chiral system, they feel the effective magnetic dipole moment of that chiral system. So they feel an effective magnetic field of that chiral system. Now, depending on the spin, on the angular momentum of the electron, you'll have spins of one handedness moving more easily through a chiral system to spins of other handedness. And researchers around the world have shown that this can improve the production of hydrogen in, in water splitting, have put it into spin valves, and they've even used it to try and get enantioselective crystallization on magnetic substrates. So you should be able to use it in, in physics, in tech. You should be able to use it too in, in renewable energy. And you should also be able to use it to separate molecules. So this is incredibly exciting. What's less clear for everyone is the fundamental mechanism by which this is happening. How can carbon-based light elements give rise to these really interesting phenomena that typically you only see in, orga in, in organic systems. So, so over the next few years, I'm working in Sandrine's amazing spin lab to try and look at spin-related phenomena in these systems, to try and control the molecular orientation, control the orientation of that helical axis, so we can really systematically investigate the properties of chiral molecules that give rise to this spin filtering, and hopefully come up with some nice structure property relationships that we all love in the LCN to explain what's going on. But it really is the kind of emerging area that, that a bunch of people are approaching in different ways. And I'm coming from a very controlling molecular orientation and looking at the spin filtering we can get out perspective. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. That's um, that's that's a great way to finish. Or also, just to say, Spin Lab is is a uh, is a facility. So so if anyone else um, would like to 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 see what's going on, there will be uh, LCN facilities talks as well, um, uh, specifically also addressing what's what's going on in Spin Lab and and what's available to the LCN community. Um, but yeah, let's um, uh, let's let's focus on 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 Jess's amazing uh, work and talk. So thank you so much, Jess, for uh, for for a great presentation and for um, spending the, the time um, at the LCN lunchtime seminars. Hopefully, we can have some um, delicious um, sandwiches, um, when, or maybe something <laughs> slightly better um, with all our speakers um, at some point in the near future. And um, in the meantime. Take care, everyone, and and um, and thanks very much. See you later. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.